And welcome back. And we're moving into our first conversation for the, the morning. As a matter of fact, in with us to talk about prison reform is the CEO of the Colby Foundation, Mr. Virgilio Murillo. Sir, good morning and welcome. Thank you. Thank you, know, you for having me. It's been a while since we've uh, sit down and talked to somebody with two L's in the first name and two L's in the second. <laughs> <laughs> unique name, right? <laughs> yes, it is. But um, so we've heard a lot of the prison of the Kobe Foundation over the past few. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a matter of fact, we had we had some of the inmates that mm -hmm. were who were actually uh, there for the 30 days during the September time, and they they had a lot to say. Right. And, from me to you is, how, firstly, how long have you been the CEO of the Colby? Uh, September make, makes it four years. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's the challenge? Let's go into uh, uh, the challenge of being the CEO of the Colby Foundation. What is that like for you? Well, it's a very challenging and very rewarding job at the same time. Um, one of the biggest challenges is trying to keep up with these boys and these women who are in prison, the inmates, because you would think that because they're in prison, they would conform to rules and regulations and behave themselves. But believe you me, the same thing that goes on in society, they play a lot of games in the prison. So you need to always be on top of your game with them. Um, sometimes it feels like you're catching a your tail, um, but I guess it comes with the territory. So, but it gets very, very challenging. It's rewarding in the sense that um, you feel so good about yourself when you see an ex-inmate out in society and you see that they're doing good. Mm -hmm. You see that they're being productive and law-abiding. That mm -hmm. makes you feel so um, good about yourself because you had a role to play in that person's life. Yes. Mm -hmm. What do you see as your overall vision as leader of this institution? Well, the overall vision really is to try and assist people in rebuilding their lives. Um, I don't have a problem if the numbers for the prison goes down and the prison ends up with precisely what it was designed for, which is to protect society mm. from crime. So if at the end of the day it goes down to 400 or 500 uh, real criminals, then so be it. But really, the, you know, when Mr. John Woods um, came up with the whole concept of Colby Foundation and what Colby Foundation believes in and all of that, I think he was all about trying to re assist people in rebuilding their lives and not thinking that it was the end of the world to go to prison yeah. because people do make mistakes. Not everybody in prison are necessarily criminals. People do make mistakes and the ones that made mistakes, you will see them stay out once they are back out. Mm -hmm. And working with, with uh, the demographics that you have, it's predominantly male at the prison. Tell us, tell us the breakdown. Let's talk age, let's talk uh, gender and the rest. All right, what I see there is um, 90, it's like roughly 96% mm -hmm. is adult males. Mm -hmm. Then you would have like a 2.5% uh, under 18s, which we consider youths, juveniles. Mm -hmm. And then we would have like another 2.5% women. Um, what I will tell you is that amongst the women, um, more than half of them are there for immigration offenses. Mm. When it comes to the youths, most of them are there for crimes of dishonesty, which is robbery, burglary, and theft, but predominantly robbery. Um, the adult males, uh, quite a number of them are there for crimes of dishonesty again, which is robbery, burglary, and theft. Mm -hmm. um, the other huge number that I see is there for murder, of which majority of them are remanded. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and again, violent offenses. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. what what's comes to mind here for me, uh, we had once the Belize Central Prison, and then we are now at the Colby Foundation. Now, I don't want to paint a picture as if it's a good thing to go there, but I want for folks to, to understand through your knowledge what's, what happens on a daily basis to try and curb the mental of a prisoner at the Colby. Well, I just want to make a clarification. Mm -hmm. The Colby Foundation is only the agency that manages the prison for the government of Belize. 
The place is still called the Belize Central, Central Prison. Prison. And it belongs to the government of Belize, um, really and truly. And what we do for sure is definitely engage people in programs. Colby Foundation emphasizes rehabilitation. Prior to Colby Foundation, it was merely warehousing these guys. You would only take them out yeah. when it is time for them to use the bathroom or those kinds of things. But today, we emphasize rehabilitation, rehabilitation, rehabilitation. And all of that is keeping in line, like I said, with what John Woods really wanted from the day he took on the foundation. Mm -hmm. um, and, of, and of course, that is in line with international standards. Mm -hmm. Because really, there's two purpose for incarceration. One is certainly to protect society against crime. And two, it is to rehabilitate the offender so when he goes back into society, he can lead a law abiding, be a law abiding citizen mm -hmm. and lead a self sustainable life. You know, I think um, I, I, w I wanted to bring something into the conversation. Recently, uh, the Belize Central Prison was featured in what, one of the world's toughest uh, prisons. <laughs> um, and, and I want to talk to you about that because you are right. Before the Kobe Foundation uh, took over the management of the Central Prison, there were some very clear violations of human rights. Absolute, absolutely inhumane treatment. Um, and uh, talk to us now of how to manage an institution where the, one of the most important uh, objectives is to be firm, but also to be fair with them as well. Those are very powerful words you use there. And um, that has been the culture that we've been trying to create, for at least over the last four years, where you're going to be fair, you're going to be firm, but fair. And as long as you run a just and fair prison, believe me, the prisoners will definitely recognize it. You have got to not only say that you want to help people, but you've got to be serious about wanting to help people. Yeah. And I think hypocrisy is something that somebody can see through. I mean, even the guy with the basic knowledge can do that. Um, we must understand that prisoners go to prison not for punishment, but they go there as punishment. That deprivation of their liberty and freedom, that is the punishment, whether they're remanded or convicted. Yeah. Okay? And my good friend Nelson Mandela says that secure prisons are essential to making the justice system an effective weapon against crime. Mm -hmm. But that definitely has to do with how you treat the prisoners. Mm -hmm. Because the prison can play its role in reducing the country's crime rate. No doubt about it. And it boils down to one thing, treatment. Yeah. So firm and fair is really the catch words there. Yeah. So. Talk to us about some of the rehabilitation that takes place because it, I don't think people really often um, consider what is expected when a person goes to prison or maybe we don't want to think about it. We just want to know that the problem has been taken care of. But ideally, what you want to do is to change, have transformation within a person that when they come back out, they don't continue the same habits. Mm -hmm. And that's hard to do, even people who have free will to move around. Yeah. So what do you do within the institution to help to have the prisoners reach this point of transformation? And how often do they? Well, one of the good things um, is that we have what you call a captive audience. They have a lot of time on their hands, and all of us, successful and unsuccessful, we have one thing in common, which is time. Uh, what we do with that time is really the difference that, decide, that determines whether you succeed mm -hmm. or whether you fail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So it's up to you. Mm -hmm. um, the prison has various programs. Mm -hmm. We have um, pr programs that deal with uh, addiction, whether it is drugs or alcohol or gambling or whatever you call it. Mm -hmm. There's programs that deals with your behavior, your behavior uh, issues, mm -hmm. anger management, gangs, gang affiliation, retaliation, um, you name it. Mm -hmm. um, there's spiritual programs, there's yoga, there's just about everything that has to do with programs. We also, aside from those programs, we have the school. Mm -hmm. The school, I mean, we were in the news, I think, last week mm -hmm. for graduating 13 out of 15 people who took the PSE. Yeah. I mean, that's phenomenal, yeah? yeah? Um, our hope this year is to try and see if we could get at least 50 people 
to take this PSE next year. Mm -hmm. and, and we're going to see how many of those are going to pass. Um, I brought some video with me. There's a prisoner that um, you guys might know very well. He learned to read at age 34, believe it or not. Wow. <laughs> you know, and I have him reading a book there, so <laughs> you, yeah. you can view it sometime. Um, people might think it's funny because it's one of those little infant two standard one reading book that he was reading, but he felt so accomplished when he learned to read in prison after 34 years. Yeah. You know, it's just phenomenal. Yeah. Wow. But we do have a lot of programs. We have vocational programs, pig grip, poultry, uh, woodwork, metal works, um, auto mechanic, those kinds of things. Yeah. What we're trying to do right, right now is link up and team up with the Ministry of Education. And I must big up um, the Ministry of Education by and large because they are assisting us big time right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And we want to try and do these um, programs that we offer, but we want to do the theoretical part of it through the IT vet um, specimen, yeah. right? So that they're certified. So that they are certified. Yeah. I think one of the setbacks for ex-inmates is that there is this stigma that follows them. Yeah. Whether they were found guilty or, or not, there is this stigma. Yeah. And I know I got flocked for it the last time because they feel like prisoners are leaving prison and expecting to take away jobs from well-deserving Belizeans and all of that. Um, I don't know how you fix those things. Herbert Gale said it in his report. He says that whenever a person will find the prison as the best place to be, society has a problem, <laughs> not the prison. I'm glad you touched on that because in our conversation with the detainees, I think that was one of the outstanding points that came out, which was that we are faced with a situation that whether someone was on remand or actually served their time or paroled and they return to society, it is difficult to get employment. Talk to me about some of the stories that you've heard um, about how this impacts the return rate, the recidivism rate. For, um, for inmates? The recidivism, um, to my mind, and, and based on what I have, and I do have some statistics that you will see, yeah. is way below 10%. Mm -hmm. I mean, in America, it's around 70%. So wow. when you make that comparison, and remember, America has all the luxuries and all the amenities. Yes. You know, they have even the, 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 the toilet facilities is made of pure stainless steel, you know. We don't have that. <laughs> and surprisingly, though, we, we, we see less than 10% returning to prison. I think one of the things I did with, these, with, the, with the detainees this last time around, I didn't mediate. I will not say that I mediated with them any at all. Okay. Because one of my stances is that I don't negotiate with criminals and I don't negotiate with prisoners. What I did is I gave them what you call a reality check. Mm -hmm. And I let them know that, listen guys, you can't do anything about situation and you can't do anything about people, how people treat you, but you can do something about how you react to how they treat you. Yeah. And you can do something about how you react to the situation. So I gave them a reality check. And I pretty much let them feel a sense of responsibility and a sense of guilt maybe mm -hmm. for their behavior and their actions. Now, I think one needs to really analyze carefully what is the dynamics playing out with respect to these gangs altogether. I think in all gang situation, you might have a bully and then you have the person who is the weaker, mm -hmm. right? Either in numbers, weaker in numbers, weaker, uh, weaker in tactics and that kind of stuff. And um, in these situations, I believe, that it is, a, it is either what you call flight or fright. Mm. So some people would fly away from the problem, mm -hmm. but some people will, out of fright, re, um, try to be on top of their games. Mm -hmm. So they will be proactive, so to speak. But the recidivism rate, like I said, is um, far lower. And I, I think it's a reality check where you, you, you don't let them focus on the situation and you, you let them know that you can't do nothing about the situation. You can't do nothing about about how people treat you, but you can do something how you react to it. And this is one of the push with the rehab programs. One of the push with the rehab programs is to try and teach them to make things with their hands. Yeah. Yeah. Because people have gone to prison with absolutely no skills. And there are people today making wood crafts, furniture, and all of these things. I have some very good examples, you know, that we could talk about. Is this <coughs> why uh, 
the skills training is so important within your work because there is a high possibility that g getting a job with a criminal record may be more difficult. I mean, we know we have issues with some people talk about not being able to get a job with a degree. And that is exactly why we want to push that. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, rather than giving a, ma a man a fish, it's better you teach that man how to fish. And I want to mention that um, we do get support, like La Ruta Maya, mm -hmm. all those trophies they give away every year. They, these are, this is one of the organizations that supports the prison mm -hmm. yeah. and the inmates by buying those little trophies from us every year. Yeah. And, I, and I, I can't forget to mention them because they're one of the supporters. Yeah. <laughs> you also make uh, caskets. We make caskets. Which are some beautiful caskets hey. as well, yeah. Listen, uh, we have made some of the most beautiful pieces of furniture, mm -hmm. whether it's wine rack, caskets, beds, cabinet. We have outfitted num numerous customers, entire house with cabinets. Wow. I mean, top notch. And these are the prisoners who are making the these. The prisoners things. make it from scratch. Let, let's talk about your tenure over the past four years. Have you seen a, a, a rise in your general population or a fall? In that? Not at all. There's a slide there that will show you that. Yeah. Four years ago when I took over, it was averaging roughly 1,600. Wow. Today we have 1,200 flat mm -hmm. as we speak right now. Can some, wow. of, some of that be attributed to uh, the changes within the drug laws, the marijuana laws? We saw a little bit of that. Mm -hmm. We saw a little bit of that. Um, definitely, no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. um, I would want to estimate uh, between 75 and 100. But what I can tell you is that we do have 213 persons on parole right now, and some of them have been on parole. I spoke to one last couple of weeks ago, and he's going to be on parole for 11 years, believe it or not. And he was there for manslaughter. <laughs> so when you, 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 there are the numbers that you were talking, no, that's the conviction numbers. But I wanted to talk about the reduction in the numbers. What, I what, have what, it broken down yeah. by conviction, remanded, and total. So. Why do you think that there has been a decline in the population? Well, certainly, like I said, the drug laws have something to do with it. Yeah. I will definitely tell you that the rehabilitation programs that Colby offers are teaching these people how to, how to manage their lives. Mm -hmm. um, like I tell you, I am not saying that out here in society may, might be uh, you know, ideal. Mm -hmm. It's not. But I think they have learned how to cope and they have learned how to weather the storm now. Mm -hmm. So they are trying just about everything to survive. Mm -hmm. One thing they're not trying to do, in my mind, is return to prison. Because the prison is certainly not a holiday camp. As much as we're going to not turn it into a hell hole, we certainly will not turn it into a holiday camp. You bet the cook. <laughs> I haven't heard that one in a while. <laughs> but uh, you, um, what are some of the programs that we see most of these prisoners, prisoners now are flocking to uh, so as to bring into society? Well, certainly we have the, the ARC program, um, which, is which deals with your addiction, your criminal behavior, your anger issues, mm -hmm. um, those kinds of things. That is the main program at the prison. Um, we, we recently, we, late last year, we instituted a program for the remanded inmates, because years ago, the remanded inmates would just sit there waiting wow. for their trial to come up. Mm -hmm. Well, that wasn't too good. Um, John Woods, again, is not a person who is into that kind of thing. Yeah. And he says, hey, man, we can't have these guys here just wait for five years and six years and seven years until their trial. We need to do something. So he, you know, he asked for donation and he got support from the Wagner's Foundation and they built a building for them. Mm -hmm. Now, this program is a little different from the ARC in the sense that this addresses gang affiliation, you know, things like that, mm -hmm. um, criminal and addictive thinking. Um, it, it's, it, its core really is to deal with the gang issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there any supplementary program uh, that is set up after an inmate or a prisoner returns back to society? That is, that is where we are lacking. Mm -hmm. We have a couple of halfway houses, but all they are accommodating is like maybe three to four people at any one time. Mm. So this is where we are very, very lacking. Mm -hmm. So who manages the parole program? Um, our prison officers manage it, and the only way we keep these guys in check really is to have weekly meetings with them. Yeah. Okay. But we do not necessarily have halfway houses where we can ensure that they are comporting themselves uh, as really. Why is that important? What well, would that add to, to uh, what you are attempting to do at Kobe Foundation? Well, it's important in the sense that um, it is a form of reinforcement. Yeah. 
Yeah. And it is a form of getting the guy to transition into society properly. Mm -hmm. Because remember, living in prison and living in society, as uh, you know, it's a little bit different. Because remember, in prisons, everything is determined for you. Yeah. When you eat, when you wake up, when you go to programs, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So oh. it's, it's, it's an environment where everything is controlled. Mm -hmm. and, and that can be very pressuring. I know that for a fact. Yeah. What about family support? Because we've heard from people who their family is the biggest part of them actually uh, changing their lives and their minds in the prison. Let's talk family D and how often does this come up and family support? Well, we have, um, we encourage family support. If you were to go to the, if you were to stick with what the law says, visits really for a particular class of prisoner should be once every eight weeks. And then a particular, another particular class is once every four weeks, that kind of stuff. Wow. But we realize, and, and I don't understand because the acts, the, the, the Prisons Act talks about that in that fashion, but then in the same Prisons Act, it also says that you must encourage family support. So I don't know, it contradicts itself freely. But Colby has taken the initiative to not really go with what that says. We encourage visits every day. So if you can visit your loved one Sunday to Sunday and you have the finance and the, and the wherewithal to do it, go ahead and do it. Mm. Because n nothing gives that man more hope or that woman more hope than to see the family you know, dedicated to visiting them regularly. And then the family day is where you get to hold your baby and, and hug your wife and you know, yeah. nothing conjugal, but just you got that real personal touch this is not something that happens in prisons any at all. But we have seen where that has brought down the incidents in the prison because people do all they could in their power to stay out of trouble so they could earn that yeah. because it is a privilege. Mm -hmm. And we have, a fil we have a policy in place where if you have more than two prison rules violations, then you don't get that family day, that bonus family day for Christmas. Mm -hmm. But each prisoner gets at least five family days total every year. Now, when you talk of, of wanting to help, there's your photo of your inmate reading. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and that's really where I want to go because I think, you know, when we think of, of the people who are sent to the Belize Central Prison, we just think of criminals. And there are people who just make bad choices. There are some people who, um, whether for, for whatever reason, um, choose to participate or choose to do things that are illegal and wrong. But there's some who, it can be argued, are victims of circumstances. At 34 years old and not being able to read, <laughs> there are very few that you can't even see a stop sign and know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, if you are unable to get a job, you're uneducated, you're poor, uh, you have many different things that may have happened in your life to lead you to that point. How do you take an inmate that is really just a product of the society and the way they were raised and ensure that they are facing the consequences for their choices, but still seeing that there's an alternative route? Well, what I'll tell you is that um, for some of these guys, particularly that mm -hmm. individual there, you know, some of them you have to break them down, no doubt. Mm -hmm. um, in his case, like I said, he, he could not read and he could not write. So mm -hmm. obviously we have an understanding issue there. Yeah. Okay, if you can't read and write, then you can't understand. But he reached an all-time low because he was one of the prisoners that were peddling drugs into my prison. I mean, huge amounts of marijuana. And at some point, I had to pretty much seal him off. Not, not solitary confinement, but put him in, a, in an area where he's with a category of prisoners like himself. And I, I always maintain that you can't teach an old dog new tricks. One of the things with the prison, Zach, is that it gives the superintendent, who happens to be me, the power to classify inmates based on their influence, based on their character, and based on their previous criminal history. Okay. He is a repeat offender. He's been in prison at least 20 times before, and for all crimes of dishonesty. And then when he came to prison, he definitely tried to continue with the drug peddling and that kind of mm -hmm. stuff, and all kind of games. So at some point, I had to seal him off for a period of time, and then he, that was obviously his wake-up call. I agree with Ms. Marlene when she says that um, they're a product of society. I have a big sign in the punishment block that says, I am not a product of my circumstances, I am a product of my decisions. And I let them smoke that in their pipe all day long. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because, uh, and that's where, that's where I think we, we need to have some understanding. One, that people do have choices. And yes. that's where I, I feel that 
um, we do have to make a distinction. There are people who come out of the same circumstances and thrive, and there are some who don't. Um, but you can't fix all of societal problems. That's something that we as a country need to work on. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you know there's someone who do isn't able to read, who has never had a job, never completed work, uh, never completed school, mm -hmm. um, perhaps really it has uncontrollable anger, many different things. Mm -hmm. um, how do you get to the core of their issues when they keep on coming in for whether it's burglary or, or whatever it is? Well, like I tell you, I have a special location where I place them. Mm -hmm. And they cannot contaminate each other because whoever is there are people of his kind. Yeah. So they are birds of a feather. So <laughs> really, that running around in the yard and having all the privilege of this, of this and that, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't exist. And this is what happened with this individual here. Mm -hmm. um, I know a time came when he called me on the phone and said, Mr. Murillo, he said, I really need to talk to you, boss. So I think he got tired of the whole fool and he decided to talk to me and I said, come, let's talk. Mm -hmm. He said, boss, I really want to learn to read and write. I don't know how to read and write. So I called Mr. Dawson, who was the principal at the school at the time. And I said, listen, listen please take this guy and let's try with him. Yeah. And then he was so proud of himself that when he learned to read, he came to, uh, he says, hey, I want to go and read for the boss. And that's when I, did, that's when I decided to, to video, do the video. <laughs> yeah. but what We actually have a viewer yeah. who sent in her cabinet since you spoke of uh, the cabinets that they provide. Yes. Um, and yes. so she showed the, the cabinets in her home built yes. and installed by, by prisoners. prisoners. Very yeah. proud, obviously, of the work done there. Yes, so. yes. You know, we, we, we also have a number we, of them. Yeah. <laughs> we, al we also, uh, um, we've, we've also been hearing about uh, good sporting teams coming out of the prison. Can you tell us about the sporting act, uh, activities in the prison? Well, recently, I, I know we played games against Gale in university. Um, I, I want to take that to the other level, really. I, I want to start getting my teams ready and bring them out on the outside to compete. But we, we have talented basketballers there. I mean, talented, top-notch, almost like LeBron James. Really? No doubt about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the, the, what, what is happening right now, the teams come to the prison. I want to switch that around and probably send teams out. Out. Yeah. The yeah. Society. Wow. You know, from your perspective, what is society missing? What, what do we not understand sufficiently about these people who come in conflict with the law? I think society, in my mind, and I, and I understand, you know, I understand. It's a, it's a hard thing. Society, by and large, are very punitive mm -hmm. and I understand it's just like I understand the human rights people sometimes not all the times and but one of the reality check I give to prisoners mm -hmm. is that we have to also remember too that you have victims on the outside and the survivors of victims on the outside whom you have violated their human rights too mm -hmm. so what, what, what's going on here? We can't be so selfish. Mm -hmm. And when these people from human rights come, I, I let them know in uncertain terms that, hey, listen, you are okay. A lot of you have not even witnessed a crime. Nobody has even robbed you. Why? Because you're sitting on a 55-foot skyscraper somewhere in Geneva, looking down on traffic with a hot cup of coffee, and these poor boys are taking lick behind here. Yeah. <laughs> so they can't really relate. Mm -hmm. And I can't, I, as a director, I cannot be so prejudiced towards the prisoners. And I will not violate their human rights. Two things we don't do at the prison. We don't violate people's human rights, and we definitely respect the rule of law. Yeah. No doubt about it. But like I said, prison, prisoners don't go to prison to punish. They go there as punishment. But that doesn't stop us from disciplining a person who breaks the rules. Because we can't have them come there and break the rules the way they did in society. They yeah. went there for a reason. Remember, the prison is the last sanction available to the courts for those persons who have failed alternative punishments. Mm -hmm. Let's not forget that. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't want the public to lose confidence in the prison. Mm -hmm. And that is why when prisoners go to the prison, we do our utmost best to make sure they don't go from there until they're legally discharged. I, I want you to, to complete what you were saying before. You said society. Mm -hmm on a whole because of what we experience and you understand that we're punitive in our thinking. But what does that mean in terms of what we're missing in understanding what 
this population faces? Well, like I tell you, what the, I, I think what society wants really is for the guy to go there and they must beat him up and they must rape him and they must this and they must that and do anything until he dies slowly. Mm -hmm. We need to understand that not everybody in prison are necessarily criminals. Things happen. And like I said about, uh, like I said a while ago about the gang situation, there's the bully, there's the one with the more numbers, bullying tactics, mm -hmm. and then there's the weakling, and the weakling are either flight or fright, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> these are some of the dynamics that plays out. Mm -hmm. And uh, hey, John, if, you, if I hear right now you're going to come to kill me, I'm going to go in proactive mode and combat mode, yeah. naturally, instinctively. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to try and take you out before you take me out. Yes. Because I want to feel safe. And the only way I could guarantee my life is if I take you out. I think it's a natural, instinctive thing. You would do the same thing. <laughs> now. So we need, to make, we need to understand that people make mistakes. Mm -hmm. People make bad choices, like you've said just yeah. a while ago. Mm -hmm. Being mm -hmm. with the wrong people at the wrong time, wrong place, wrong time. These things happen. Mm -hmm. Rahelia, I hear you say several times that there are criminals and there are others. How do you make that distinction? Who's a criminal versus the rest? Well, I'll tell you what. One of the ways I gauge that is um, when they come to the prison, they want to continue to engage in some of the foolishness. Mm -hmm. For example, you might have a guy that comes there for drug trafficking. Then my intelligence tells me that, okay, this guy is still peddling drugs. And sometimes it goes so bad as, uh, it goes so far as you catching the guy with the drugs. There's people who come to prison for murder remanded mm -hmm. and then before you know it he's involved with an assault mm -hmm. he stabs another prisoner or he beats an another prisoner or he sets up a hit against another because we we rely a lot on intelligence yeah if you're going to manage a prison you have to have very good information beforehand mm -hmm. and we have a core uh, employees that definitely gives us the information beforehand so that is why we have managed to keep the if you look at the statistics you'll see that the contraband is down even the incidents are down yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so, wh so what you're saying is when they don't come in with an intention of changing behavior. Mm -hmm. Yes. When it w so this is how you could determine. Yeah. 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 So w w we're quickly running out of time and I you've really given are. us so much information. But, uh, you know, <laughs> we don't uh, about nothing yet. <laughs> what, we, what we want <laughs> is to see less people go to prison because we want to see less crime. Yeah. Um, and I, I want to take it back to, to something broader, which is looking at the, the value system that mm -hmm. people have. Yeah, you have people who say, oh, you know, they need more God, they need to, to go to church from an earlier age. Or, mm -hmm. But is there something that you recognize, a commonality mm -hmm. in most of the prisoners who come through your system, in how they view uh, whether it's a decision making <coughs> process or their role in society, that you think we can change from an early age in the younger ones growing up? Well, one of the things I recognize a lot, because you had asked earlier, what is the demographics in yeah. terms of age? Mm -hmm. Well, I will tell you that majority of the crimes, whatever those are, whether it's murder, whether it's crimes of dishonesty, are being committed by people who are of the ages 18 to 25. Mm -hmm. What I have noticed over the years is that it looks like when a person reaches the age of 35, then I see they start to taper off in terms of coming back to prison. Mm. So it looked like they have reached an age of maturity by then. Yeah. So they stopped doing the foolishness, right? Um, Nelson Mandela again says, "No one knows a, uh, no one knows a nation, or no one knows a country until they have been inside its jail." Yeah. Mm. And he said, "A nation must not be judged by how it treats its highest citizens, but its lowest ones." The demographics in prison is a lot of these guys have hardly went to standard six. So you would understand that the lack of education, knowledge is power. Mm. And if a person doesn't have knowledge, they have, doesn't have education, uh, really and truly, I would want to champion the powers that be that I think education by and large needs to be free. People need to be given an opportunity to get free education, especially primary school. If they can extend it to high school at least, that would be super. 
from primary school. But I am saying that nobody should be deprived of us. And I think the whole issue of truancy needs to be enforced. Yeah. Children must not be allowed to not go. Hey, some little guys came from Mango Creek the other day. One of them 14 years old. Baby. And he only went to stand a tree. Why didn't you go to school? Well, and throw him out because of bad behavior. Teachers need to be more tolerant. Teachers need to be more patient with these kinds of people. Counseling. Mm -hmm. How do you send a 14-year-old child to prison? It's a baby. And for burglary. And went to burglarize the church. Okay. Something is wrong there. Yeah. Yeah. In, the, in the 30 days detention crowd, there was a 14-year-old again. Baby. How could he have been caught up with this, in this drug net? Something wrong. And then he was thrown out of school too. And why was he thrown out of school? Because of bad behavior. So, we, uh, you know, I want to, like I say, I would encourage the powers that be that, you know, try and ensure that these people get an, uh, an education and try to be more tolerant and, and patient with these cases where the child seems really belligerent and that kind of stuff. Because sometimes, hey, we have them in the prison. Remember, the prison ends up with all of society's social ills, you know. But you have to apply dynamic, um, dynamic tactics yeah. to get to them. Like the guy that began to read. <laughs> you know, I mean, geez, we've been struggling with him. He was flooding the prison with drugs. I understand in one particular case, he got 30 pounds in, in one day. You know, that was just how good he was good. And he can't read. And he can't write what he could add. So, but some, some dynamic thing plays out in prisons. And um, I, really, it has taught me a lot. I've gained a lot of experience over the last 16 years yeah. that I've been there. No doubt about it. You know, before you leave, the, 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 the business aspect of the prison is one of the things that I think we need to touch on more. Reason being is because it is a way for the prison to raise some funds. Mm -hmm. So if I would want, if I want to do something in my house, build new cabinets, what do I do and where do I contact? Who do I contact? Well, I... You could contact me, that's for sure. My number is 610-0878, and then I will channel it to the appropriate people, depending on what you want to buy, because we, do, we, we make cement blocks as well, 4, 6, and 8 inch. So let's go with it before, before we... Uh, yeah. You make cement blocks. You make woodwork, cabinet, mm -hmm. um, metal works, burglar bars, mm -hmm. these kinds Card. of things. Um, th yeah, those are pretty much what we engage in. And there's in. the gift shop that you can Yeah, the gift in. shop, yeah but, yeah. yeah so. but anything you want, you can ask. We can customize. You want a door with your face in it? We can do that too. And it's <laughs> going to look just like you. Identical. <laughs> Moody. <laughs> oh, the wood. Oh, the wood. There All right. Go. Well, there of course, go. we just scratched the surface on the work taking place yeah. there. But we did want to take uh, we, the opportunity to just find out more what's taking place in terms of the rehabilitation process of our prisoners. Yeah. So thank you so much for coming thank in you. and talking about that. Thank you. All right. We're going to go ahead and take a break. When we come back, we'll be talking about World Mental Health Day. So stay tuned.